anyway, so uh, thanks for coming. I uh, greatly appreciate it. My name is Thorsten. I own uh, this company here, Arctic Sun Arena. Most of you probably know me. Uh, we decided to uh, bring in these HIVs about uh, a year ago when uh, I was really running into problems on our high efficient houses on the heat recovery side. I couldn't just really meet passive house level. I hooked up with Zender and we installed a, a prototype unit basically, in, or it's not a prototype unit, but for us it was uh, an HIV system in uh, my personal house, which we built two years ago. And um, I was really, really impressed with the performance on it. It's really a day and night difference between what we've done before, uh, which really lead me to uh, look more into the uh, ventilation side than I had before. And uh, I'm really convinced for high performance buildings that. This is a really an essential key for us. We need to have better heat recovery ventilation and we also need to have preheating on the incoming fresh air uh, system basically, which uh, can be achieved fairly easily with the Zender system. So I'd like to introduce Barry uh, with uh, Zender North America. I know that the audience here in Alaska has got a little bit more experience with heat recovery ventilation than a lot of my audiences because it is more mainstream here. So this brings us to cold climate and defrost or frost protection, which is a major factor in this market. Somehow preheat that air coming in so that you don't have frost. And you can use electric or hydronic heating or ground source preheater. And those are the, the options that we have in this market in Fairbanks, Alaska, where it gets down to 50 below zero and where you have well below zero for many, many days and, and I guess it's months, right? The best case possible is to have continuous ventilation. And so coming up with a frost prevention mode is your best option. So the best solution by far up here is a ground source preheater. And what this is, this is actually an installation in Vermont. This is our ducting system. This is a fairly large house. It's actually a passive house, but it's a pretty good size one. This is a lot of ducting. Normally you'd have half of this. This is supply and return on this ducting system. So two of these manifolds are for supply, two for return. But what you've got here is this is the ground source pre preheater and this is the HRV. I think I have another picture that's a little closer up. Yeah. So these two pipes are off of a geothermal. They're actually doing a geothermal heating system for the house as well. So we tapped onto the ground source unit in the well and are circulating glycol through the coil. And so the air comes in here, comes through a filter, comes through the coil, and then it comes into here. And when it's called for, this is wired directly here with a, a temperature sensor and with power to the comfort unit. And when it's called for a certain temperature, and I think this one kicks on around 35 degrees, the pump comes on, circulates through the coil, the air comes in and it's pre-warmed and prevents frost. As far as the power consumption of that, it's about 8 watts to run the pump. So it's a very efficient way, once the installation is done, to provide frost protection. In the summertime, that same 40 degree ground temperature, 40 to 42 is what Thorsten's telling me he's getting on his systems. That same, same 40 to 42 degrees is going to be cooling that air coming in. You can theoretically, um, when you're, if your house is using a lot of solar and you're getting some solar gain in the house, you could cool it off with that air. It would pre-cool pre the air. And if this air is coming in cooler than what's going out and your house is warm, what's going to happen is the bypass comes on and now we're bringing that outside cooler air directly into the house and helping to cool it. The big thing is if your house is built right, your loads, both heating and cooling, are absolutely minimal. And Torsten, you have more experience with the specifics yeah, of that. The key thing to remember here for us, you know, I mean, let's, let's be real. How, how many days of 50 below do we have sometimes? Right. And what happens on a regular HIV? How do we keep them from freezing? I mean, if you don't go into recirc mode, this thing is a, a, a piece of ice. 
So that's what happens on all of these HIV systems at 50 below. They just open up, close down, and they recirculate. And we are completely cutting off proper ventilation in the house. Yeah. Effectively for maybe three weeks. Is that a good option? You know, that's really what we have to really start to think about a little bit more. And it took me quite some time to really understand that too. Really, what as far as indoor air quality goes, uh, without preheating, we are completely at a loss for ventilation. It's just impossible. We're fighting physics, and that's unfortunately not a good, good fight. We always lose. It's impossible. You know, and uh, I turned my uh, ground loop off by accident last year in the programming. I don't even know why, but. Uh, the core froze up. It was a solid block of ice uh, without the, yeah. the ground loop, really. For our climate, really, this is to me the complete answer. And I maintain a two degree differential at 50 below between supply and return. I mean, this is incredible if you think about the efficiency and maintaining proper indoor air quality. That's really, we're, we're looking at ventilation, not at heating or anything. We need, this is essential for, for a good building, you know, to be able to have fresh air at, at, available at all times. And you, you know, you were running at a 50 below and it never even blinked, right? I mean, it's... No. I mean, it's a two, deg two degree differential even at that temperature. It's not, you know, that's the thing to remember. This is not a heat pump, not at all. It's just a ground heat exchanger. You know, it's a glycol It's a simple system. And it runs only at 12, 12 watts, you know. So if, even if you're running one of the units uh, combined the HIV with the ground unit, we're still running at a lower energy consumption. All the, the, the standard units, uh, uh, they still run at 72 to 80 watts just to run. Just to, 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 to give you an idea, this is, this, is another, this is that project in Vermont running a ground source unit. And what you've got, this, this system, when the, when the pump is running, it's running a combined 25 watts. So yeah, it's seven watts plus 18 for the HRV. We're looking at 25 monitored on a data logger. And we could see it go from 18 to 25 when the, the pump comes on. So you're running 25 watts. This is your air temperature, the red line. So when you've got down at zero degrees here, this is what's coming out of the Kumpfelfan ground source unit. So you can see we get this lift for seven watts. If you figure out raising the temperature of air from zero to 38, 37, 38 degrees for seven watts, that's absolutely phenomenal. You know, much bigger curve for us. Yeah, but it still is working at the same. Yeah. Oh, no, for sure. And below to 40 degrees, that's you know, a lot of delta two. And this is the original Kumpfelfond, which you are also using. We've since come out with the next generation. It's called the Comfortfond Eco. It has 50% more capacity on the coil. So we're looking at, and you can see, this is, it wasn't on yet. You can see it's just sort of mimicking it. And this is where we kicked it on. And you can see that this, this is an anomaly again. We think this is another, uh, you know, monitoring anomaly. But you can see, this just basically goes on this 40 degree line it's within a couple of degrees of 40 degrees. It never varies coming out of the, the Kumpfelfond. And the temperatures are, you know, all below 40. But a lot of it is below the freezing line. And this is, the green is your indoor, air, or the temperature out of the HRV. And the blue line here is the in, inside temperature. So you can see we got a pretty tight line there. We're within two degrees, always. So if it's 70 degrees inside, you can see the 70 degree line. They're running right around 68 to 70. And this is always with the temperature monitors. We always get this kind of fluctuating, but it's, it's really very consistent. But you can see that uh, that's a pretty tight number. So when it's zero degrees outside, you're getting this out of your heat recovery ventilator. And you've, you've consistently monitored it, what, with, it's within three degrees? Yeah, on average, it's within two degrees different. Yeah. So at minus 50, Torsen's 70 degrees in his house, he's getting 67 to 68 degrees coming out of it. And he's expending 25 watts or so. Yeah. That's a pretty good numbers. Which essentially <laughs> means, you know, on a high efficient building, you can run your HIV to keep your house from freezing. Yeah. You know, 
know, that's completely uh, a different story than with a normal, normal ventilation system. You try to do that and you have a frozen house pretty quickly. What does the installation of ground roof look like? You know, the, the, that's really simple. Uh, what we do usually in new construction, of course, it's always easier. When we do the septic systems, it's basically we're looking for uh, 400 feet of three quarter inch packs filled with glycol. And we're just looping it around the house basically. And uh, so it's just uh, goes right under the septic system. So we're creating, uh, we're getting the waste heat from the septic. Uh, I place it under the septic system, under the leach field, and then we just continue to dig around uh, a trench basically, loop it right back around and come back into the house. So it's a fairly inexpensive uh, installation. And it takes about uh, 400 feet of packs. And I try to keep it uh, in our climate at 10 to 12 feet. It seems like ERV, it needs to go hand in hand with just improved envelopes, right? Because we're traditionally, I think we're moving out of the phase with super insulation stuff, we're moving out of being concerned about humidity in our house because of mold and condensation. Right. But now we got to beef up our envelopes so we don't have to worry about that as much and we can start focusing on the occupants and providing enough humidity to prevent respiratory illness. So yeah, I mean, my is that, do you think my, my conclusion really on this is, uh, you know, the building systems which we have developed, you know, with basically living in a plastic bath. There's yeah. no, absolutely no hygroscopic capabilities within the building period. Yeah. So the building itself cannot function you know, as a system. And that's really one of our core problems we have with this really dry air. Uh, we are able, you know, with these diffusion open walls we're really building now uh, to maintain 30, I have 30, 30% humidity in my house year round, basically in the winter time. With, without, an H, uh, without an ERB? Without an ERB. Because you know we're creating a lot of humidity, yeah, and if it can't go anywhere uh, in, a, in a building, then we're having these issues: windows icing up and whatever else, and then we're overventilating to get rid of it. Right. And we're bringing for below air; it's no humidity. You know, there's a boom that dries out the building, and then we had, we, we're stuck with 15 15 percent, and that's very unhealthy for humans. And yeah. uh, if you have a building which can absorb and release moisture. On the inside, you're solving that problem. You know, people live, they move, go to work, come back. You know, there's a huge, huge spike of humidity during the day. Yeah. Uh, you take a shower and you have this huge spike. You know, and it can't go anywhere at all in a normal building. How it is designed? You know, properly designed with hygroscopic capabilities. You know, it, it gets absorbed and then you know it finds equilibrium. By the time you're leaving, you know, it comes back mm. to the closest. Point, and the ventilation side is critical to not overventilate so that the building can do what, it, do what it's doing. If you ventilate it too much, then you'll dry it out during those periods. Yeah, which is, you know, something which we, we constantly fight here because, you know, our vapor barriers are right on the inside. There's absolutely, you know, on a standard five-star plus home, you know, you have a five-gallon bucket of water you can absorb in a whole building as far as hygroscopic capability goes. If you look at an old log building, that's 500 <coughs> gallons. 500 gallons of absorption and, and release within, within uh, the envelope, basically. And if we don't build systems which you know, can, can deal with that, uh, then we have these issues. And we overventilate because we run into problems. Yeah. And the problems persist you know, because it's human health. Yeah. The building is happy, but right. you, know, you have nose bleeding and you have static. And it's just very unhealthy. And I think that uh, really low uh, humidity levels are uh, more dangerous to us than the higher PPPM levels. You know, if you really look at you, you know that to me again, I can't stress this enough. You know, looking at our climate, ventilation, proper ventilation is so so important. And with most strategy we do right now, I mean, it just doesn't work because you know, at 40 below, you go on research and you don't have really proper ventilation. If you're looking at a bedroom, you know, it takes two to three hours to reach 1200 ppm in a bedroom if you don't supply fresh air. Two people sleeping. Well, and you're also, if you are in re happen to be in research mode when you're taking a shower, yeah. it's ending up in the bedroom. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's you know, people don't they close the door. <laughs> yeah. Throw a couple of huskies in there, and now you've got six people. <laughs> I'm serious. A, a medium sized the, the, the statistic that I've gotten is that a medium sized dog produces the equivalent CO2 as two adults. Wow. 
dogs have very high metabolism and they produce a lot of CO2. So two adults and a couple of dogs at the foot of the bed, it's like having a party with six people all night. Thanks everybody for coming.